This morning's sermon is entitled, Paul's Prayer Request. You know, almost 500 years ago, on October the 31st, Martin Luther nailed his 95 points of discussion uh, for debate uh, on the church door of a castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Of course, that sparked the Protestant Reformation. 800 million Christians in the world today trace their spiritual birth to the truths that were articulated by Luther and the other great reformers. Well, our text this morning is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And we're making our way through this wonderful book in the Bible, and we've come to the final section of three sections of this book. You notice Paul begins this section with the word finally. He's indicating that he has finished the main argument of the letter. One of the overall themes of this letter is enduring trials in light of Jesus' return. But Paul still has some exhortations and some encouragements to give this congregation. And he begins to enumerate them in this passage that we're going to look at together today. So as I read through this passage, I'd like for us to be on the lookout for a few things. In verses 1 and 2, Paul makes a prayer request, and that prayer request will come in two parts. One part is at the end of verse 1, and one part is at the end of verse 2. That is, the first thing I want us to be on the lookout for is this double prayer request. Then in the middle of the passage, in verses 3 and 4, Paul expresses confidence. And again, there are two parts to this expression of confidence. One, he says something about what God is doing to cause him to be confident in verse 3. And then he talks about what God is doing in the Thessalonians, and that causes him to be confident. And so he mentions this double confidence at the end of verse 4. Then the third thing I want us to be on the lookout for in this passage is a twofold blessing. That's found in verse 5. Because after this prayer request in verses 1 and 2, and this statement of confidence in verses 3 and 4, Paul promotes, uh, he pronounces yet another benediction. We've already encountered a benediction at the end of chapter 2, we're going to see another one at the end of chapter 3. When Paul's letters are filled with benedictions or blessings that he prays or pronounces on God's people. And this benediction has two parts. And so let's be on the lookout for these things. Two-part prayer request, two-part confidence, and a two-part benediction in this passage. So let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing before we begin. Heavenly Father, this is your word. And we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. So we ask today that you will help us to see the truth which you have spoken to us in your word. And that by your spirit, you would apply that truth in our, in our hearts in each and every situation this morning in our lives as we find ourselves. Lord, your words are always timely. And they're always, um, they always give instruction and guidance and encouragement. But Lord, uh, you've known before the foundation of the world exactly what every hearer of this passage needs today. So we ask that you will speak to our hearts and that you would receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is God's Word, beginning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So may the Lord write His eternal truths of His Word upon all of our hearts. You know, in this letter, Paul does just what he does. And here's what I mean. For example, in the end of his letter to the Philippians, he ends the formal teaching section and he introduces his conclusion with this word, finally. But he still has an entire chapter to go. And so that reminds us of what many preachers do. They'll say, in conclusion, and then they go on for a while. But when Paul does this, it isn't because he can't seem to find a place to land. He's doing it for a particular reason. It's almost as if he has looked back over the letter that he has written, or perhaps even dictated to his secretary thus far, and he has re realized that he still has some things he wants to bless this congregation with. He wants to exhort and encourage them in some things. And isn't it interesting that after pronouncing this word finally, and he's into this final section of the book, that he begins with a prayer request. He asked the Thessalonians to pray for him. And one of the reasons he does this is that Paul fully understands that the work of gospel ministry is ultimately God's work. That it doesn't matter how gifted he is, it doesn't matter how faithful he is, 
Well, God's work is God's work, and it requires God in order for it to prosper. God has to do the work in order to make it successful. And so he begins by asking for them to pray for him. So let's begin in verses 1 and 2 with this twofold prayer request. So point one on your outline then, a twofold prayer request. Paul's words are, brothers, pray for us. But the language that he uses indicates that he's asking the Thessalonians to keep on praying. It's not like he's saying, well, you haven't been praying, and I'd like to ask you to start praying. He's saying to them, I know you're praying for us, and I'd like you to continue to pray specifically for two things. The first thing we see here in verse 2 is that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. That's very interesting language. And it's a great prayer request to pray for anyone who is in gospel ministry. And guess where that comes from? Paul's language comes right out of the Psalms. If you turn with me to Psalm 147, especially and look at verse 15, you're going to see exactly where Paul's language comes from here when he says that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored because Psalm 147, 15 says, He sends out His command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. Hear Paul's prayer request coming out of that passage? Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. His word runs swiftly. And then if you turn back further in the Psalms, if you go all the, back, all the way back to Psalm 19, which is the psalm that tells us the heavens declare the glory of God, the sun and the moon and the stars of heaven declare God's glory. And in Psalm 19, 3, we're told that even though the sun and the moon and the stars don't speak to us audibly, even so they provide testimony to God's glory. Verse 3, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Meaning that although they don't speak audibly, Nevertheless, their voice, their line, it's gone out. Then look at verse 4. It says, And their words to the end of the world. So when Paul says, Pray that the word of the Lord may speed ahead, it's a prayer for the success of the gospel and for the spread of the gospel in the world. He's likely thinking of the word of God traveling swiftly to the ends of the earth. You know, if you ever wonder, how should I pray for campus ministers and evangelists and church planters and missionaries and for faithful gospel ministers in churches in our community, in our state, in our world today? Well, this will be a great prayer. Pray for the spread and the success of the gospel. He's asking the Thessalonians to do this because Paul's faithfulness is not what's going to bring that success. God's blessing is what will bring uh, the spread of the gospel and the success of the gospel. And so he says, Thessalonians, I covet your continued prayers that the word of God would spread just like it spread to you and that it would be honored just like you honored it. Remember what he said back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13? I thank God that when you heard the word of God, the message of your salvation from us, you accepted it not as the words of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which performs its work in you. So he's praying that just as the gospel came to them and was honored, that they now will turn outward to the community and to the world and be concerned for the spread of the gospel, that it would be honored elsewhere. One of the ways that you know that the gospel has taken hold in your heart is that you care about the gospel taking a hold of other people's hearts. If you don't care about the spread of the gospel... If you don't care about other people coming to faith in Christ, if you don't care about the gospel changing hearts and lives and other people, well, it's very doubtful that your life has ever really been changed by the gospel. Because those who have been transformed by the grace of God, those who have realized the forgiveness of God, the undeserved, and the glorious uh, Christ-purchased, secured forgiveness of God, then you'll want everybody to experience that. So isn't it interesting these people to whom Paul has become a missionary and with whom he has shared the gospel and they've come to faith in Christ, he now asks them, you get to work praying for that others would come to faith in Christ. You know, that ought to animate the prayer life of every congregation. Dear friends, that would be a great prayer. Whether you are in your Bible study fellowship groups or gathered with us on Sunday evenings when we're having our corporate prayer time, this would be a great prayer for us to be praying for our campus ministers, evangelists, church planters, missionaries, and uh, ministers every time we're together. And of course, when we are in our private prayer time as well, that would be a great prayer. 
That's not the only prayer request that Paul has, though. Look in verse 2. He has another. He says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Now, this is, isn't theoretical for Paul. We know that because, you know, we've read Galatians, we've read Romans, and we've read some of Paul's later letters where he had people that dogged him every step of the way, everywhere he went in Asia Minor, trying to undermine his teaching and the doctrines that he was proclaiming. There were people that contradicted the glorious gospel of grace that he was preaching everywhere he went. So this wasn't theoretical for Paul. These were real people. Predominantly, we call them Judaizers. But of course, there were others that contradicted faithful teaching as well. And they were trying to hinder Paul and his ministry. And Paul says to the Thessalonians, Brothers and sisters, please pray for us. Pray that we will be delivered from evil and wicked men. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? That these are, these are people that are trying to hinder the gospel. And I'm sure that in their own minds, they thought they were doing something good. But Paul calls them wicked and evil. And dear friends, ministers of the gospel in our own country today, more and more, will need that prayer in our day and age. Do you know that the hindrance of the gospel, the censoring of the gospel, is more legally possible in our land now than it has ever been? And there is no sign of that sad tendency slowing down. In fact, there's every sign that it will likely be ramping up. So that there will be places where you could simply read the Word of God aloud without comment, and you would find the gospel and gospel men being hindered from doing the work of the gospel simply because it was read in a place where it offended someone. And the offended have decided that they don't want to hear those words in their ears. And some will consider that even hate speech or discriminatory or any other politically charged label you want to put on it according to how secular individuals want to define it. And so the gospel itself is likely to be closed off, shut down, forbidden in those settings. So we need to pray for church planters and campus ministers and evangelists and missionaries and ministers because there are people out there who want to hinder the spread of the gospel. These are two good petitions that we ought to regularly pray for ministers of the gospel. That's the first thing that Paul wants us to see in this twofold prayer request. But there's a second thing. After asking for these two prayers to be lifted up and for his companions, we, we see a twofold confidence. So point two on your outline then, there's a twofold confidence here. Paul then says, I want to tell you that I'm very confident of what God is doing. So he speaks of this twofold confidence. It's an assurance that Paul has in the Lord about what the Lord is doing for the Thessalonians and about what the Lord is doing in the Thessalonians. Look at what he says in verse 3. The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So Paul's saying that he is fully confident that the Lord will guard and strengthen the Thessalonians. And particularly this also includes the reality that the Lord will protect us from the evil one. Now this language is slightly ambiguous because you could translate that he will protect you against evil in general, just like our King James version of the Lord's Prayer where it says deliver us from evil. But it could also be translated deliver us from the evil one. Here, Paul is certainly thinking of personal opposition to the Thessalonians, just like the wicked and evil men were seeking to hinder him in, in, in his ministry, and most likely the evil one and how he wants to attack the Thessalonians. Either way you translate it, Paul is very clear. There is a supernatural personal force in this universe that wants to destroy you. He's just spoken in chapter 2 about the man of lawlessness, and in, in, in the man of sin, an instrument of the evil one against God's people. Paul is confident that the Lord will deliver us from the evil one. Do, you ever, do we ever factor that in, uh, in the struggles that we experience in life? Whether it's in marriage or family or vocation or whatever arena it may be, that the evil one is seeking to destroy God's people. I'm not talking about blame shifting. I'm not talking about finding a demon under every rock. I'm talking about acknowledging the reality of a supernatural personal force in this universe that wants to destroy us. 
This is not about blame shifting for our sin or excusing our sin because of what the evil one has done or is doing. You know, some of you are older, old enough to remember the comedian Flip Wilson. And I'm, I'm really dating myself now. Some of you younger people are saying, who in the world is Flip Wilson? But he was a comedian, and, and he was on various shows, The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, Ed Sullivan, uh, Dean Martin Show. He had his own show for a little while. But he would get up and tell these funny stories, and he had this character that he would go into, uh, a lady named Geraldine. And one of the, his famous catchphrases was, the devil made me do it. Well, all big, you know, it was a big laugh from the audience every time he would get up and tell these stories. That's not what Paul's talking about here, blaming our actions on the evil one. Paul's talking about the fact, and it's stressed over and over in the New Testament, that the evil one is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, this kind of language is used and this teaching is given over and over in the New Testament. So do we realize it's not just our sin for which we need to be on the lookout? It's not just the opposition of the world, but it's the world, the flesh, and the devil that are arrayed against the Christian. Incidentally, Martin Luther sings about that in that well-known hymn that he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He sings about the world, the flesh, and the devil in opposition to the Christian. But what Paul is saying here is that he is confident that the Lord will establish and guard us. He will guard and strengthen us against the evil one. He's with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will protect us. And that is a tremendous truth that we so often forget right when we need to remember it. Hundreds of times in the Bible, God says, I'm with you. Twelve times in the Bible, He says, I will not leave you. Eight times, He says, I will not forsake you. So we ought to ask ourselves, what am I so worried about? So often we forget God's promises and that He's with us and that He will not leave us or forsake us. And Paul's trying to remind us of that here. He's saying the Lord will protect you and strengthen you. He will guard you and establish you. Don't forget that, Christian. Don't forget. But that's not the only confidence Paul has here. There's another one. And here's the twin that he offers as an expression of confidence. Look at verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. You remember Jesus' marching orders to the disciples in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20? What were they supposed to do after Jesus left? They were supposed to teach the disciples to obey all the things that Jesus had commanded. Remember, that's, that's their job in discipleship. It's not just to teach them you know, the doctrine that Jesus had taught just so they could know it, but to teach them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded. And Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, I have confidence that you are obeying the Word of God and that you will obey the Word of God. But notice what Paul says his confidence is in. He says, I have confidence in the Lord that you are and you will do the things that we have commanded. In other words, Paul is saying, this isn't just my confidence in you. It is confidence in what the Lord is doing in you. I'm confident that I can see evidence of the Lord's work in your life. Not only is He for you to guard and protect you, to strengthen you and establish you, but He's also at work in you in order to grow you up in grace and in order to grow you in holiness and that you'll obey Him. Do you ever find yourself looking back about things that you struggle either to do or not to do in maybe 20 years ago. And that now the struggle, it seems to have significantly diminished in your life. You don't know this the same level of struggle with that anymore. Now I realize there are a lot of things that we can look back 20 years ago that we're struggling with and it seems like we're struggling just as hard with those things today. I understand that. But have you ever found yourself thinking without any pride or any, any, just only gratitude, you know, I, I used to really struggle profoundly with that. And honestly, I just don't sense that struggle anymore. Now, that's really encouraging. Well, what causes that? Is it because you and I are just such wonderful people? Certainly not. Is it because we've just tried so hard for so long that we finally broke through? I don't think so. It is the Lord's work in you 
That's why you're not struggling as hard with those things anymore because over the years, God's Word, the work of Holy Spirit in your life and in my life, as you've gathered together for worship, if you've opened the Scriptures daily, as you've gathered in small groups, if you've prayed with your family and your friends, your spouse, your family, the, the Word of God and the Spirit's application in your life, well, that's washed over you repeatedly until God has changed you in that area. It's the Lord's work in you. And Paul says, I see those evidence is in you, Thessalonians. You may not be able to see them, but I see them. I see the evidence of the Lord's work in you. And he speaks of this twofold confidence that he has. And then finally, he speaks of a twofold blessing at the end. So point three on your outline, a twofold blessing. And notice both parts of the blessing in verse five. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the endurance of Christ or to the steadfastness. Of Christ. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts first to the love of God. By this, Paul means God's love for you. May the Lord direct your hearts to look at, to know, to contemplate, to understand, to experience, if I dare say, to feel the love of God for you, to know it experientially that God loves you. you now, I know many Christians today struggle to know that God loves them. They trust in Christ. They believe the gospel. They believe every word of the Bible. But they struggle for a whole variety of reasons with this experiential knowledge of the love of God. I suspect they have deep wounds from their past, abuse, injustice, betrayal, abandonment, terrible loss. Maybe they have a sin for which God has forgiven them, but they're agonizing over the guilt of a previous sin that was significant. And how can God love me after I did that? Well, if that is your brokenness, then you're going to go out into battle already half beaten. And here's the apostle saying, I'm praying that the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, would direct you into a personal and experiential understanding of the love of God for you. Because that's absolutely important for what we have to go through in the Christian life. So there's this first blessing. May the Lord direct you into an understanding of God the Father's love for you. And secondly, this is so interesting, may the Lord direct you to what? To the steadfastness of Christ or to the endurance of Christ. In other words, Paul's saying that he wants you to look squarely at the endurance of Jesus Christ for you. He's calling us to endure our trials and tribulations, but God never in the Bible asks us to do something He hasn't done or is prepared to do. And, and when it comes to endurance in the Christian life, God is saying this to us. My son has already endured for you. Look to him. When I called you to endure, I want you to look at Jesus' endurance for you. He endured deprivation, poverty, suffering, pain, sorrow, rejection, mock, mocking, torture, death. And He endured all of those things for you. So when I call you to endurance, I want you to be directed to contemplate the endurance of Christ for you. And all of that means because of our faith union with Him, then we can endure in Him. Not, not ourselves, not just, you know pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, trying hard, doing it on your own. No, we're enduring in Him because He's already accomplished that for us. You know, so often we run into experiences in our lives and we're thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can make it through this or not. Lord, I, I just don't think I can survive this. You know, I'm not a journaler. Sometimes they'll encourage people to journal spiritually in their Christian life. I'm not suggesting journaling is a bad thing. I just don't do it. I've tried to do it in the past. I usually make it about two or three days. For one, I just never really feel comfortable with writing down those deeper thoughts that I have. Uh, a beloved professor of mine told me, he said, you can always just open up a Word document on your computer, type out all your thoughts, read back what you wrote, and then exit the document without saving. He said, I can help you process things, maybe think more clearly. I think he's right on that. And I've done that on occasion. But part of me wishes I had kept a journal because I think it would be a great tool 
to give me a reference points in my life. I think it would help me have a better perspective on life overall. Because I'm sure about one thing. If I had kept a journal, and I went back and read what I wrote in my late 20s and 30s, and if I could have a conversation with my 20-year-old self or my 30-year-old self, I would say, you have no idea. Because what you're going through now is nothing compared to the things that are ahead of you that you don't even know about. You know this little thing that you're so upset about today? Dear friend, that was a walk in the park. And you thought the world was coming to an end on that day all those years ago? You have no idea. I think that's part of what Paul says when he says, May the Lord direct you to the endurance of Christ. Because there is nothing that the Lord is going to ask you to endure that Jesus hasn't already endured and much more. And so contemplating the endurance of Jesus is going to do what? It's going to put those huge things that you think you're facing into perspective. It's not, you know, not that you're immune to suffering and pain and, you know, it's just that you have a better perspective on it. Jesus has not only already endured for us so that he is able to sympathize with us in the very things that we have to endure, but he's also going to put what we have to endure into perspective because what he endured of course is far greater far worse thank thankfully than we are ever called to do as believers so paul has this twofold prayer request twofold confidence and he pronounces a twofold blessing on us that we'll be directed into the love of god the father and into the endurance of christ for our everlasting good and so May the Lord make us all able to take that deeply into our hearts and be transformed by it. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, will you teach us to believe this blessing, especially the love of God our Father for us and the endurance of Christ our Savior on our behalf. Will you apply this teaching to our hearts and lives in such a way that we can't possibly miss it? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.